So I'm Dean Wampler. I uh, work for Lightbend, as many of you may know, and run our big data uh, product development efforts. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a substitution for somebody who couldn't be here, so uh, this is only loosely related to Reactive in a sense, but uh, I, think, I hope you'll find it interesting. And it's a talk about uh, what we've learned from running big data systems, especially Spark on the JVM, the, the strengths and weaknesses of the platform, and uh, what we're doing to deal with the weaknesses. Uh, the photo, I like to stick my photos in, in slides so that if you're bored with the content, you have something pretty to look at. Um, this is actually the North Cascades, uh, sorry, no, that's the Olympic National Park uh, west of Seattle on the Olympic Peninsula. It has both a beach front, which is, you know, a wild beach, and, uh, and not wild because it's a party scene, uh, and also mountain scenery, so it's a fantastic place to hang out. It was just really a great trip, actually. Okay, so you can uh, find this talk, and actually a longer version of it, at my vanity website, polyglotprogramming.com slash talks, and you can spam me at these addresses, Twitter or email. Uh, so I'm going to do a little dishing on uh, the JVM, what's good and bad about it, uh, so I thought I'd throw in a picture of deep dish uh, pizza. Never mind. Anyway. <laughs> Is he really going to go on about that? Um, Okay, let me first talk about Spark. How many of you have actually used Spark before? Okay, this will be a little bit of a review, but I'll go through it kind of quickly, just to give, for those of you that don't know much about it, you know, why is it interesting? You know, it's basically a distributed computing engine for the JVM that's, you know, oriented obviously towards data processing. It's uh, like a replacement for MapReduce in Hadoop systems, for example. And it got really popular because the biggest Hadoop vendor, Cloudera, said, you know what, we should start using Spark instead of MapReduce from now on. Uh, it gives you the illusion that you have one collection of data that you're working with, but in fact it's partitioned over a cluster. They're called resilient distributed data sets is the term. And resilient in the sense that if one of these uh, partitions gets lost for whatever reason, it actually knows the sequence of processing steps you went to or went through to get to that point. So it can reconstruct the lost partition, things like that. So you don't have to like keep duplicate copies in memory just to avoid losing work. Uh, it also, it's, it's pretty nice for productivity. I'm going to show you some examples of why I really love writing Spark code, because it's very concise, especially if you use the Scala or Python APIs, but you can also use SQL, Java, R, which is the language statisticians like. You can interact with it. You can, you can be running on this massive cluster and setting there either, either with the terminal prompt, you know, the Spark uh, rather the Scala REPL uh, in, you know, interpreter, or any of the other th four, of, well, three of the languages except for Java. And if, and if you've downloaded the Java 9 uh, interpreter, which you can actually do now, uh, you might be able to run it with this. I'm not sure. I haven't really tried. Actually, no, I've tried it. It doesn't actually work. The Java 9 interpreter does not work yet uh, with Spark. But one of the cool things that uh, an interpreter enables is you can work with these notebook environments. How many of you have actually ever played with like IPython, Spark Notebook? Okay, good. I actually think it's a fantastic way to play with Spark because you can intermix documentation, graph results, write code and evaluate it, edit the code, reevaluate it, that kind of stuff. So it's, in fact, the, the Spark training that I wrote for Lightbend uses a, a notebook environment like this. So a lot of things that make productivity really nice. So let's look at an actual example, uh, inverted index. So uh, the hello world of big data is always word count. I'm going to read in in parallel a corpus of documents and count all the words. Uh, but the next step, especially if you decided you wanted to be the Google killer, is write inverted index, which would be like your first tool for a search engine. And here, rather than forget where I found the words, I'm going to actually remember where all the words were found and then count the occurrences relative to each location and then invert that, so go from you know, original document content to words, and then a list of document counts, document counts. And that would be like a, you know, something you could use as a search engine, for example. Here's the whole program in Spark using the Scala API. Um, the Java 8 API would be maybe twice as big. The Java 7 API would be maybe 20 times as big. Uh, Python and R are very similar. I'm not actually going to walk through this, but I, uh, I would like you to notice the stuff in pink are like all the method calls. So it really promotes this idea of functional programming where we do a sequence of transformations of immutable data structures to create new things. 
And, you know, when I sat down and wrote the first version of this a couple of years ago, because I was familiar with the Scala Collections, which is the basis for the Spark API, you know, I just kind of knew what to do with flat map and filter and all those things. And so it took me about half an hour to write the first version of this API. And it's not because I'm a genius, even though I am. Um, <laughs> it's actually because, you know, I just had those, that toolbox and it just, you know, I could think about, I, I've got the data in this format, I want to get to this format, what are the steps I need to go through and you just bang it right out. And that that's, that's just makes it so much fun to write code like this. Um, and that's why I think, actually, I think uh, Big Data is the killer app for functional programming. I got into f interested in functional programming, you know, like 10 years ago before Hadoop got really popular because everyone was talking about the multi-core problem. You know, we're, we've hit Moore's law limit, now we've got to go parallel if we're going to keep scaling. So we, now we have to learn how to write concurrent code. And people talked about functional programming as the right way to think about it because it emphasizes immutability, and mutability is the most common source of bugs and concurrent code and, and on and on. But actually, I think it's stuff like this that's really driving a lot more people to adopt functional programming. Uh, we, we see a lot of uptake of Scala in the Spark community for this reason, more so than even like microservice stuff. But yeah, it's, you know, it's like 10 steps or something of transformation. Actually, maybe the next slide shows that a little better, where I you know, sort of schematically showed it on the right. Um, and we, you know, once you learn to think in terms of data flows and you know, transformations and stuff like that, then it just kind of falls right out and it's, it becomes a beautiful experience writing code this way. And, and you're highly productive. You know, 30 minutes, you try it out, tweak it, keep refining it, and uh, it's the way we should really be working. But it's also fairly efficient. So I said, sort of in passing, that these are immutable data structures. If I had terabytes of data that I was loading, I would not want to make terabyte copies you know, at every single one of those steps. But Spark doesn't do that. What you're actually defining is a lazy, directed acyclic graph of processing steps. And it's only when you say, give me results, that it actually figures out how to schedule this across your cluster and run it. And it even does things like what they call pipelining, where you know, if I'm just running up through a bunch of partitions in parallel and, you know, I'm like filtering some things and I'm transforming some records, but I don't need to short or shuffle stuff between things, like for a join, I can just, you know, streamline all of those little steps together into one big step and only materialize the end of the big step. Um, and in this case, it turns out that when you, you, have, you suddenly do like a group by statement, is, there's effectively two group by statements in this program. That's when you need to like, shuffle key value pairs around your cluster. So it's pretty efficient about this. And we're going to talk about how they keep adding orders of magnitude of uh, performance improvements on top of that uh, to address other performance issues at the JVM level. So really love programming this way. And when you have good abstractions, when you have a good core, then you can layer on top higher level APIs to let you uh, think in abstractions that maybe make sense to you or actually are better for the problem. So, you know, it seems like everybody in the world practically knows how to write SQL statements. A big revelation for me was about, you know, eight years ago I was doing some consulting with, uh, it was actually Orbitz in Chicago, they have their, their headquarters in Chicago, and I was talking to some uh, you know, business analysts, folks that were never programmers, they've always done, you know, uh, business analysis for this particular team I was working with, and they told me that they had taught themselves basic SQL queries so they could ask questions of the data themselves without having to ask the developers or the data team to write queries for them. And it just suddenly occurred to me, you know, that's right, it's not that hard to learn how to write basic SQL, it's the great equalizer in a lot of ways. So, why not? Why not make everybody able to, you know, ask questions of the data themselves? Uh, the, the API is called the Data Frame API. It's sort of morphing into the Data Set API for reasons we don't need to get into. But it basically gives you either the ability to write actual SQL queries or a SQL-like domain-specific language where you're still writing in the native language. And here's a, a, a little simple example. Uh, what, we're, what I'm pretending to do, this is actually real data you can get. You can go out and get all of the uh, airline data for all the commercial flights that have happened in the last 20 years. It's, kind of a fun data set to play with. It's shocking how many flights are canceled, for example. You know, and if you fly a lot like I do, it's kind of fun to play with this data set. But uh, you know, I, I start off with some import statements. Let's, here's, I'll blow it up a little bit so we can maybe see it a little better. Uh, you always start with a Spark context, and then you wrap it in a SQL context, and that's how you get this data frame API. Actually, this is changing it. The current release of Spark that just came out is 2.0. 
This setup has changed a little bit, but otherwise it's kind of the same stuff. There's some nice built-in features where if I have this data, like say for all the flight records and then like the data of all the planes in, in existence, I can just load it as, uh, Parquet is a really popular format in big data. It's kind of a column-oriented storage format. It could be CSV or whatever. I'm going to register the, and actually another nice thing about Parquet is it actually has the schema of the data embedded in it. So just by uh, loading the data like I'm doing in the first two lines, I, I actually have the schema for, for these records as part of my metadata. And I'm going to register temporary tables. All, this is actually very trivial, but it lets me write SQL queries. It's really setting it up for that. Uh, caching is where the abstraction leaks. By, by said Spark was lazy, that means every time I run a query, it would actually go back and reread the data, run through all the processing steps. And maybe I don't want to do that, right? Maybe I do sometimes if the data is changing, but usually you want to cache it in memory so that it just has it local. And that's all I did here with these cache commands. But it's kind of a leaky abstraction in that way. All right, so to get to the meat of it, here's the SQL query. Hopefully all of you can read this and you've written queries like this, where I'm just going to join the flight data with the plane data using the tail number on the plane. You know, that's the one that starts with N. that You may have seen pa uh, painted on the end of uh, airplanes, usually under the tail part, which makes sense. It's just called a tail number. But, um, but, but otherwise, it's a normal SQL query. It's uh, Stringly typed, if you've ever heard that expression, meaning that I won't know until runtime that it's actually bad. It's a bad query because it's just a string. So maybe I don't like that if I'm writing a production job. I might want to use a, a, a domain-specific language that at least gives me some type safety at you know, compile time. And that's what this thing does. It's basically the same thing. I'm taking my flights data frame, joining it against planes, and then doing some sort of clause that specifies the join criteria, the join con um, predicate. Let's drill into that for just a second. So here I've highlighted that join predicate with a triple equal sign. Uh, it, this is actually not an anonymous function like I would use in the RDD API where I do like a map over something and say, you know, pass a function that knows how to do joins. The problem in Scala and Java has this problem too in Java 8. Those anonymous functions you use or Java 8 lambdas are become opaque bytecode to your library, in this case Spark. So Spark has no ability to optimize what's going on in the join because it doesn't know anything about the join clause. This is actually, I said all this is lazy, right? This expression here actually is compiled into a mini abstract syntax tree that knows everything there is to know about what you're joining. And it, then they can actually use this for optimizations that we'll talk about in a minute. And in fact, they're doing custom code bytecode generation based on these join clauses, these little ASTs. When they introduced the data frame API, uh, they, they put out this table. Uh, at the bottom, the two blue lines are the performance of the RDD API for Python and, and Scala. And at the time, the Python API was about twice as slow. Just going between Python and the JVM, you know, about a factor of two overhead. But the uh, data frame API was not only twice as fast as the Scala API, but it was twice as fast for all of the languages. So this is like the first time in big data that you could write in almost any language, at least that was supported, and get the same performance. Those of you that did, have done Hadoop for a while, how many of you have written Hadoop code for a you know, long time? Yeah, I can see the pain and loss of innocence in your eyes. <laughs> um, but basically, you know, it, the common thing was you'd have your data scientists build this model of stuff, and then they'd toss it over a partition to the Java developers and pray that they didn't screw it up when they translated it to Java. But you kind of don't have to do that anymore, which is pretty sweet. Uh, actually, this chart, if you redrew this chart today, those green lines would probably be about a tenth as long as they are now. They've just, it seems like every release they figure out a new way to double or, or raise by a factor of 10 the performance, and we'll see why shortly. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Spark project has really focused on optimizing the data frame API as opposed to the RDD API. And one of the reasons is because it's a more constrained problem. You're trying to optimize SQL as opposed to a Turing complete programming language effectively. And, you, and because of things like I just mentioned where they, they actually know what you said as a join criteria rather than this opaque anonymous function, um, it makes it much easier for them to do optimizations under the hood just like a database does, you know, has done for a long time. So this is like, I just grepped sort of, uh, pulled these functions out of, I 
I think I pulled them out of the actual source code, but if you look at the, the yellow names, there, there are things that you would recognize uh, or could associate with SQL operations, you know, like select and uh, where clauses and, and uh, counts and stuff, so forth. So another big API they've added is uh, what they're now calling structured streaming. Uh, so Spark started as a batch mode system, but, but then streaming suddenly got interesting, and so they figured, you know what? We're not, a, we're not a streaming engine, but we're pretty fast. What if we just captured little mini batches of data, like you know, some fixed time interval, and then ran little batch jobs over that? So it's a mini batch streaming model with le uh, latency down to maybe half a second is a reasonable latency. And it looks something like this. You know, I've got these, you know, these little time windows, and I'm going to have some data streaming in, and I'll just capture data in those windows. Each of those uh, windows will become an RDD, and then I can run a job over that. And they also added things like window functions. So I could do like moving averages, you know, things like that. It turns out that this is kind of a real problem now because it's not, it's not competitive for real streaming problems with Flink and Gear Pump. There will be a talk about Gear Pump tomorrow. There was a talk on, about Flink this morning. Uh, so they're actually r working to make it a true streaming engine. But for right now, this, really, this is what's going on under the hood. And then just for completeness, I'll mention two last libraries. One is a machine learning library called, there's really kind of two of them now, ML and MLlib, uh, so that you can do things like linear regressions and, and uh, k-means and stuff like that. But I think actually where this is going is they're, they're not trying to build this up too much more because Spark is already a big system, but there's so many people building third-party libraries like all of these deep learning libraries that you'll probably just see more like integrations with third-party libraries with maybe some core API code here. And then lastly, there's a gra uh, for like representing data as graphs, there's GraphX. Uh, this also, I think, is going away. It's kind of not being developed very much at the moment, but there's a new library called GraphFrames that might replace it. But sometimes it's really nice to represent data. Like if you think about the follower graph of Twitter or Facebook, there's lots of interesting queries you can write over that data if you have it represented as a graph. You know, like, get, show me all the followers of followers of this guy or something. Okay, anyway, that's our, kind of our overview of Spark. Let's go back to the real questions, which is, you know, what is this like as a platform uh, for big data? And we'll start at the foundation. This is my favorite photo, actually. That big green thing in the front, that's one of those cables they use to attach big ships to docks. You know, it's about, you know, two inches in diameter. The, the beach was unfortunately lit, littered with uh, shipping detritus, and a lot of it was from Japanese fishing boats from the tsunami. You know, there were a lot of like floats with Japanese written on it, and this was, I think, probably from the same disaster. So, you know, why are we using the JVM for big data? Well, it's probably not surprising that it's it's it is a great platform because we we had at the time big data really got going. We had like 10 years of experience. Now we've got 20 years of experience running big JVMs. There are a lot of people that know Java, so it was a natural thing to start with. And so, you know, we started with this foundation that's grown now to include lots of tools like IDEs. I just this is like a splatter list of stuff. Uh, we've got several languages besides Java to work with. And, you know, a little shout out to Clojure. Um, and uh, the, actually, these are some favorite Scala libraries that I like that are that are related. You might recognize the first one, Akka. So maybe you've heard of it. Uh, <laughs> And then, so now we've got this huge list of tools that people have created. Uh, this is Summingbird, is the, is the icon on the right. That's actually an abstraction. Twitter wrote on top of Scalding, which is like a precursor to Spark and Storm. And then there's other tools here. All of these are open source and uh, you know rich options. So it's it's a great platform to build stuff at scale and and whatnot. But it really is not perfect. There's definitely some issues. Uh, the first one is a very pragmatic issue, which is that the data community has for a much longer period of time been working with Python and R, and it's just a, a richer ecosystem in terms of libraries and tools. You know, there's just no denying it. Uh, a lot of us are trying to fix that in the you know, JVM world, but that's, that's why data scientists often still prefer to use these tools uh, as compared to, say, Java or Scala. But uh, closer to home is garbage collection. Um, if you've ever worked in finance, you know, they're really paranoid about garbage collection and, you know, like some pause that causes lots of trades to be missed or whatever. But it actually gets dramatically worse at big data. And part of the reason is that we're now running heaps that are hundreds of gigabytes in size, whereas 
for typical services, whether they're micro or macro, <laughs> we typically haven't needed more than a few gigabytes for heap. But when you, you know, the, the actual code might still be less than, you know, a few hundred megabytes, but now you're putting, you know, billions of records in memory, so you need lots of memory. I, I've had customers, you know, running, typically running a service with 256 gigs of RAM, and they're just putting it all in, in a JVM heap. So it just really pushes uh, the garbage collector to the breaking point uh, in, in ways that we really had to deal with before. So just for example, if you're using this old style garbage collector that I have the image for here, you end up with a lot of uh, cached RDDs in the old generation of the garbage collector, and then it becomes very expensive to actually clean them up. So you can get enormous uh, GC pauses. I think the world record actually is in... Uh, uh, the, the Hadoop distributed file system has a service called the name node that actually keeps the entire metadata for the file system in memory. And there was one garbage collector, a collection pause that was clocked in at like 23 hours. Something like that. <laughs> um, which, you know, probably broke some SLAs, I'm guessing. But uh, if you're interested in this subject, uh, there's a great blog post on the Databricks site where some in, uh, Intel engineers did a lot of experiments about GC tuning for Spark uh, and came up with what they recommended for the best settings. But I think it il illustrates that this is a Band-Aid solution, right? W the, that we've got to do something about the core problem rather than just try to you know, tweak how things run to, to work around it. And the real problem is actually the, the JVM object model which is a fantastically flexible tool for a lot of the stuff we've been building for 20 years, you know, where I have like a graph of, so I've got some customer who's shopping on my site, I pulled in data about the customer, I've got their order, you know, or shopping cart, whatever. And that sort of general JVM, or rather object graph, is, is a nice thing to represent in, a, in the flexible way that the JVM lets us represent it. But what if I have trillions or billions, whatever, of identical records and now I've got all of that in memory. That's where the thing doesn't work so great. So let's look at some examples of this. Um, how many bytes do you think this really is? This four-character four string. Uh, you, minimum, you think four bytes, but what is it really? Anybody know? I'm not hearing. I hear some mumbles, but not. Uh... Does someone say 48? You're right. It's actually 48 bytes just for that one string. Now imagine I've got a billion of them, right? There's a 12-byte header for every, every object. There's eight bytes for the hash code, which is always calculated for objects. There's 20 bytes for the array that's holding these characters, just for the array, not for the characters. And then there's eight bytes because they're actually UTF-16. So that doesn't sound terribly efficient. If I happen to know that I've just got trillions of ASCII strings, I don't really want to have all this. So more examples. So if I have an array, you know, arrays are nice because they're packed together, right? But if it's not primitives like array of integers, if it's an array of strings, in this case, then I've got all of these arrows off somewhere else in the heap. And it's these arrows that are the enemy because I have to walk all of these billions of arrows to do garbage collection. So I want to get rid of the arrows as much as possible. Uh, here's just sort of a made-up example of a class representing a person where I can inline their age, but I've got you know, nested references to other things like the address object, the string for their name, and so forth. And then even hash maps, which are used a lot in Spark. You know, the, the, uh, each, for each hash bucket, it's a linked list, so I've got you know, just tons and tons of, of references around the heap. The other big problem, of course, with references is that I'm going to get cache misses. So, you know, a cache miss is like 200 CPU cycles, typically, in modern CPUs. I'd really rather stream data through the cache lines, you know, through the, the trees of caches, so that there's always the data I need next in some cache line accessible to the CPU, so I get no cache misses. This, all this stuff is absolutely horrible for cache coherency. So how are we going to improve performance? Well, here's the thing. It used to be that I.O. was actually the problem, and it wasn't this, like in the old MapReduce days. But a lot of experiments have been done in the last few years to determine that even if you eliminated network I.O. and disk I.O., you can only get maybe 20% better, but not orders of magnitude better. So that tells us that really we have to do something with what the CPU is doing, and it turns out memory management is the big one. 
But, but just as a little su aside, so why did we flip to IO bound, or from IO bound to CPU bound? Well, one reason is that hardware has been evolving like mad too. So we have these 10 gigabit per second ethernet, and it's, you know, we're 40, you're starting to hear people talk about. SSDs, of course, are a lot faster. We're also using I.O. more effectively, like Parquet limits the, uh, it kind of constrains the data that's actually pulled off disk, rather than naively sucking everything into memory and then throwing stuff away, we're much less likely to pull stuff off disk we don't need. We use caching a lot more. We do things like, um, well, e even the computations for Parquet require, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but the formats like Parquet and others are making it, uh, are actually reducing the amount of I.O. we have to do. And then we're using our CPUs more to do serialization, more compression for things like Parquet that compresses automatically, and, and a lot more stuff that requires you know, fairly heavy computation like you know, joins and group bytes and so forth. All right, so obviously you should always try to improve your algorithms, make sure you're not doing stupid things like you know, order in algorithms when you could use you know, log in or order one. But, um, but in our case, what we really want to do is use memory much more effectively. So a couple of years ago, they started this project called Tungsten, which is a, like a multi-spark release project of optimizations you know, targeted to this problem and focused on the data frame API, you know, making SQL queries as, as uh, fast as possible in Spark. And it had a couple of goals, one of which I sort of mentioned already, which is to reduce the arrows, to get rid of as many references as possible. And if you do that, then what you end up with, hopefully, is you may, you may still need the same amount of memory, but if you've done a much smarter way of laying it out, then you, you have fewer but bigger objects to garbage collect, and that's a much easier problem than lots of little garbage. So we'd like to do that. It turns out when you do something enough, it becomes painful, like virtual method calls and boxing and unboxing of primitives and, and even if statements you know, lead to overhead that it really adds up at data scales. So we'd like to eliminate some of the uh, expression overhead. So this example is contrived, but what, it, what you might say is, well, in order to implement this, I'm probably going to use a virtual function to, at runtime, figure out, are these doubles, are these integers, whatever, and then I'm going to have to call the right virtual function to you know, do the calculation for the right type and, and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of overhead here that you'd like to eliminate which we'll see how they do that. So here's what they did. They started with a new object encoding, and for, for each data row in the data frame, it uses this compact row type, which is basically a, a bit level encoding. So you start off with a bit field that says, for each field, is it null or not? And if it's null, then I don't need to do anything else. I'm done. If it's not null, then the next block will have uh, eight bytes per field. If it's a primitive, I can stuff the literal value in, in that little eight bytes. If it's not, it'll be a reference to this variable length section where I'll encode strings and things like that. If you look at this, then you've got something that fits in a cache line, most likely, uh, so that I can just stream you know, a bunch of records through my CPU much more quickly with fewer cache misses. The other uh, two cool things, I think, is that now I can do hash code and equals on raw bytes. So I can tell if two things are equal just by ripping through the bytes until I hit two bits that aren't equal. I don't have to like walk the trees of these two objects and call is equals or whatever on each one. So these, these things are dramatically faster too. And that's great if I'm using these as keys and I'm like doing a join, I can just rip through them really fast when I'm trying to do quality checks. So we've gone to something like you know, what we had a minute ago that's kind of messy to this very simple encoding. Uh, because they use hash maps a lot, they wrote their own hash uh, map implementation called bytes to bytes map, so it's sort of oriented towards uh, uh, bytes as keys and values. But it's just, instead of having a linked list, it's just this big chunk of memory where they, they stuff the key value pairs together. And it's actually faster to walk through it than to uh, walk the links. You know, so we get this effect. And in some cases, they allocate memory off heap. They use the, miss, uh, the uh, infamous sun miss on safe, to, which is basically access to malloc and free. But uh, most of this, I think, is actually done on heap. But there are cases where off heap is, is better. So for, for this issue with uh, the expression overhead, they, they, uh, they generate custom bytecode for these sub-expressions. 
But in fact, now in the latest release, Spark 2, they generate custom byte code for the entire query. You know, they, they analyze the whole AST for the query and then just rip out byte code that's customized for the types of the fields, for what it's doing. And that actually gave another like, order of magnitude performance improvement in the latest release of Spark. Uh, they also uh, expanded the SQL dialect to be basically SQL 2002 compliant, you know, with some limitations. You can't do transactional updates and stuff like that. But uh, the numbers are pretty impressive for the uh, benchmarks that they ran against. Okay, there are a few other things that uh, really are not very optimal about the JVM. One is that there's no value type. So what does this mean? Well, if you've ever written C or C++ code, you know that you can either allocate memory and then have a reference to it, or you can ev even push structures on the stack. You, know, you can pass a whole structure as an argument to a function. It just goes on the stack. There's no you know, inter interacting with malloc and free. And then when you pop the stack, it just goes away. It's garbage collected. So that's what you would really like to be able to do with Scala. Uh, well, any JVM language. I said Scala because Scala actually has this optimization for very limited cases. And here's just a contrived example. Uh, suppose I have a timestamp class with a lot of nice methods for converting to different things or whatever, but it's actually only got one data field, which is a long, which is the, you know, the epic milliseconds or something. There's no reason I have to heap allocate this, these instances because that, all I've really got is data that you know, is, is a regular primitive, so why can't I just push it on the stack when I want to pass one of these instances to a function or return one? And uh, it turns out there is a way to do this in Scala for the special case of a single element that's a primitive, but you'd really like it to be more general where if I have a basic class that's just a structure, you know, like maybe three integers or something. I'd love to just push the thing on the stack and not heap allocate it. That would make things faster. There's actually discussion of adding this to, the, to, uh, to Java, to the JVM. And then, then it would just be done as an optimization, uh, I think, at, at uh, uh, runtime. Uh, long operations are not atomic. You may not know this, but only 32-bit operations are guaranteed to be atomic. So you would have to, in principle, unless you know that you're thread safe, you can't really trust it long, uh, long addition even. Uh, this one really annoys me. There's no unsigned type. So what's factorial of minus one supposed to be? I can't enforce you know, in, the, in the method signature that only unsigned integers are allowed. You know, I have to do something else. That's also really kind of a pain if you're using integers as like bit flags and stuff like that. This one is a massive problem for people implementing big data tools like H2O and uh, Spark which is that arrays are indexed with integers, which means if I have a byte array and I have unsigned integers, I can only have a two gigabyte array. I can only have two billion elements in an array. And uh, you know, I said earlier, this is like you know, chump change for, for uh, heap sizes now. So it's actually kind of annoying that I have to, I can't just allocate like a 100 gigabyte byte array anymore. So I want to finish with, um, an example that I ran into recently with a customer that kind of also shows a limitation of another aspect of working with Scala in particular. And, and this, is, this, this is a contrived scenario, but it's very close to what they saw. So I'm in the Scala interpreter. Well, it's actually the Spark interpreter. They, they just use the Scala interpreter, so it shows the Scala prompt. Uh, I'm going to declare this, very, this uh, integer that's uh, 1.1 billion. And then I'm going to create an array of shorts that will be just over two gigabytes in size. Okay, so it's, it's a little too big to serialize into bytes because I would need that many bytes, and, but I only get two, two billion bytes. So that's, that's the reason for the size. It's just too big to serialize by itself. Uh, it turns out Spark has this nice size estimator where I can ask how big is something? Uh, and it, you know, it's, a, it's a guess, but it, yeah, it's, pretty, it's actually correct in this case, it's about uh, 2.2 gigs with probably little overhead. Now Spark has this idea of a broadcast variable. So suppose you have a lookup table that, you, that all of your nodes need to see when you've partitioned your data. You know, it could be like stop words. Like I want to filter out all the thes and the he's and the i's and so forth because I'm doing natural language processing. Uh, I could do that with a join, but sometimes it's just easy to have a hash map or a set of some data that I'm just going to look at as, as I stream my records through. So they have this broadcast variable that will broadcast the, I can use to broadcast my big array around the cluster, and then it'll just be available in all the tasks. If I do the size estimate of my <coughs> broadcast variable, it's small because it's a reference to a big thing, but the thing it's, 
but the uh, broadcast variable itself is small. And then I've got this contrived example where I'm going to take the uh, numbers from 0 to 100,000. This is a way to de declare a range of numbers. Turn it into an RDD, which is what Parallelize does. And then I'm going to map over it and reference my broadcast variable. You call value to extract the array and uh, just you know, return the ith index into the array. What actually happens, by the way, if you don't know much about Spark, is this scparalyze.map function call actually happens in my driver program, in this case my Spark shell, and that builds up this you know, directed acyclic graph that will be run somewhere on the cluster later on. But what happens is this function inside that i, you know, i arrow, which is the argument list, and then the body, that gets serialized into bytes, sent over the cluster, deserialized so it can run remotely. It's not at all obvious when you read Spark code that you know, where things actually run. You just kind of learn from experience what gets run locally, what's actually going to get serialized and run over the cluster. And if I, um, yeah, so I, run, I try to run this, and then it blows up in my face. Let's see, it's just, I guess maybe I have to hit the air. There it goes. So it goes boom. I like that effect. Was that impressive or what? Um, and you get this here. A requested array size exceeds VM limit. So somewhere I'm trying to uh, actually request an array that's bigger than two gigabytes, but where is that happening? And then it gives me the stack trace. So it looks like somehow I captured this big array somewhere, or some big array, but how did that happen? Well, uh, actually I lied to you. It's not really the fact that I was using a big array, it's the way the REPL works, the Scala REPL. So in fact, Spark does if you try to pass it an object bigger than two gigabytes, it does actually shard it into pieces so that all the little byte arrays that it creates when serializing are, are small enough, under two gigs, and then it reassembles on the other end. It, it handles that okay. It didn't matter that my initial array was too big. That wasn't the problem. The problem is the way the Scala REPL works, the sort of magic it does that leaks when th something like this happens. So if you look at the stack trace, this is, this is what you get. I cut out some pieces, obviously. The first step is I was actually in that map method, so it was trying to serialize that little function that I passed. Oops. You know, the, the, this, this is going to work up, and I just have this, I want to hit the up key, but I have to hit the down key. So anyway, here we go. So it's, it actually has this nice tool that verifies that it can successfully serialize this function, and it does that by serializing it. So it tries to serialize it into a byte array, and it's when it's trying to make a copy of that byte array that it blows up. But the problem is there's no array in here at all. I, now, it's true that I'm referencing the array with this value call, but that's going to happen later once I'm on the node. The B itself, remember, that was like 2,000 bytes. Uh, the I is just an integer, or maybe a long. Uh, there's no actual array in this thing that I'm trying to serialize, so where did it come from? It's actually this array, it's the one that we created initially that was 2.2 gigabytes. And the question is, why did it happen? Well, it turns out Scala gives you the illusion that you're just writing code outside of classes. The JVM requires, with the exception of some stuff now, it requires everything to be in a class object, you know, class with an instance. So this is actually illegal code from the you know, JVM point of view, where I just declare stuff. And in fact, what the co compiler does is it synthesizes these, uh, these classes and then just embeds your expressions inside it so that it can compile valid bytecode. And I've greatly simplified what you actually get, but it's something like this. So what happens is that when you reference B, you're actually referencing a field in this instance which is the, you know, up near the top that's declared B. And whenever you reference a field inside a, um, an instance, then it's going, and it's doing, you're doing serialization, it's going to serialize the whole instance. But another field is the actual array. So I actually am serializing the entire object, all 2.2 gigabytes, even though all I really have is this tiny little expression that I care about. This is completely opaque unless you happen to know what's going on. So this is something that you really don't want, right? And it's because the abstractions leak. So we've actually looked into re-engineering the REPL a little bit to work around this problem. But for the time being, you, you need some workarounds. And I'll finish with those just quickly. One is to declare it transient. You, if you've been doing Java forever, you know that just marking a field transient means it won't be serialized. And that actually works in this case. 
you know, a more general approach is to embed stuff like this in a separate object. If you don't know Scala, you can actually declare singletons in Scala. So this is like the equivalent of static members of a regular class, is all I'm doing with this object. So I put all these things in, in a singleton, and then do a, a local variable assignment to just the field I want, and then it'll be fine. It'll, it will not attempt to serialize the whole array. And that actually works. Well, um, for time's sake, I won't talk more about why I like Scala instead of Java, but, but if you get the longer version of this talk, I go through some of the reasons. And, and some of them are things like pattern matching is a really great way to determine what the record structure is, to tear it apart into constituents, and so forth. But just other little things like that make uh, the Scala version of, uh, of a Spark job much smaller than a Java version and a lot more fun to write. I wish I had more time to talk about that because it can be... It's one of my favorite things to talk about, but for time's sake, I won't. Instead, I'll just uh, remind you of the URL, uh, polyglotprogramming.com slash talks. Um, if you'd like to find out more about what we're up to, uh, you can go to this Fast Data link and uh, talk, to, talk to us. We have a little booth in the uh, main hangout area. Feel free to talk with us. And I have a few copies of a report I wrote that kind of explains our view of what structured applications should look like. So. Um, I'll leave these up front. Anyone wants to grab them, there are also plenty of copies uh, in uh, the vendor area if you want to get them there. So feel free to grab these. But anyway, thank you very much. And any questions? <laughs> ah, there we go. Yeah, so the question was, what's uh, the performance of Spark SQL versus, say, classic MPP databases? Those are probably still faster, although Spark continues to get pretty incredibly fast. They're faster because they can do a lot of optimizations, where Spark is <coughs> excuse me, a more general tool, and it's at the mercy of your like, Hadoop file system, you know, the storage tier. Um, but it probably outruns MPP databases if you're at the size of data sets that are bigger than classic MPP databases can handle. So if you're talking about doing a query over a petabyte of data, you, know, you probably can't do it with most of the MPP databases. But if your data fits inside that MPP size, then it may still be faster. And usually the SQL is a lot richer, the maybe more mature than what you get with the uh, Hive or Spark SQL or Impala, those kind of things. But I think the gap is closing, and then it becomes the question of, is my data really that big, and what's the cost per you know, terabyte, let's say, to store and operate this data store? You know, any others? Do you have your hand up or just... Okay. <laughs> um, okay. All right, well, thank you very much.